Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here at the sysadmin miniconf. Uh, I feel like I'm amongst my people here. Um, I'm a sysadmin. I'm an old beardy sysadmin, and like most old beardy sysadmins, I'm kind of cranky. Today, I'm here to be cranky about service discovery. Uh, so before I get started, real quick, if you have questions, stick your hand up, ask away, I'll answer them, we'll move on. Um, don't do Q&As at the end, they're boring. Nobody wants to listen to that at the end of the talk. So, talking about service discovery. What is it? What does it do? Like most things that sysadmins uh, deal with, it's esoteric, a little bit boring to outsiders, and absolutely crucial to the proper operation of a distributed system. So it lets things find other things on a network. And then once those things have found those other things, you find out how to talk to those other things. Now, the most stupidly simple service discovery system you can imagine is hard coding. OK, I'm sure that at some time or another, we've all hard coded some, some IP addresses in there. And then at some point down the line, about usually about 15 minutes after you get your second machine, you realize that you have hard coded that, that IP address in about 14 different places, and you're never going to find them all again. So you go, oh, what can I do? I oh, know, I'll indirect. I'll get some, some names. I'll put some names on things. That way, when I move things around, I just change my, my host files. And then you get to three or four machines, and you realize, yeah, this editing host files thing on a whole bunch of machines, don't like that. Centralized database. And this was great for many, many years. This has been working for, for sysadmins around the world for probably a decade or two now. It's really great. But then something happened, as things are wont to do. This happy little fellow came along. And all of a sudden, systems were, were a bit more dynamic than you really wanted to have a sysadmin you know, banging away. And then we had microservices came along. And all of a sudden, oh my God, so many things connecting to so many other things. We didn't have time to edit all of our, our, our zone files anymore. And then, of course, the, the, the death knell to, uh, to static DNS-based uh, service discovery was containers. These things are whizzing up and down all over the place, 100 times a second, containers up, containers down. Nobody, no human can keep up with this anymore. So, so people looked at this and went, well, this, OK, this isn't going to work. What else can we do? And they came up with lots of options, many, 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 many options. Now, I have very strong opinions about most of these, having run many of them in production and had all of them bite me in the ass in one way or another. Um, the most common problem is that service discovery is, is fundamentally an, an, an AP operation in terms of the CAP theorem. You need availability and partition tolerance. You don't necessarily need 100% consistency. And the reason for that is that your service discovery system is always out of date. There's no way that you can have synchronous operations between your entire service discovery system and the services they're discovering and the services that are trying to discover things. So your services that are making the connections always have to be able to handle failures and errors. So you want to err on the side of, of availability over pure consistency, and most of those there don't. So it gets very nasty. So there are a great many options, and here's another one for you. This one's a standard track RFC, 6763 DNS-based service discovery, um, written by a couple of very clever people at Apple, based on many years of experience doing service discovery in Apple Talk networks. Now, in, in, in DNS-based service discovery, or DNSSD, as those cool kids of us in the know like to call it, the, the main thing you're talking about is service instances. This is a, a type of service and an instance of it. So we might have uh, this, this foo.app. Got the underscores in there because they're serve records um, for reasons that we don't need to go into. But this is, this is a serve record that says the foo instance of the app service lives at these parameters. And the serve record, I love the serve record. It is a fantastic record type. It was standardized 17 years ago. But way, way, way back in, in the year 2000. In fact, DNS, by the way, turned 30 last November. So rock on, DNS. And the components of a serve record are, are, are pretty cool. Um, you, first off, you've got a host name. Okay? No, no IP addresses running around in here, which is great, because it means that it's uh, protocol agnostic. You're running IPv4, you're running IPv6, you're running dual stack, go for it. Add A and quad A records however you like. If you're doing uh, address migrations, if you're renumbering your system, you can put two addresses in and all just sort of works way behind the scenes. Then you have your port, your port number. 
Now, we're used to using well-known ports, okay? I've got about 100 of them racked away in my head over the years, you know, I've just accumulated them because that's the sort of thing my brain likes to do rather than remembering my wife's birthday. Um, but serve records mean you don't have to worry about well-known records, well-known ports anymore. You can have anything you like. It means you can have multiple instances of a service running on one machine if you like. Or at the very least, you don't have to keep track of them by hand. Um, I had a text file, it was full of ports and, and client names. It was not a lot of fun. Um, you can also do load balancing. If you want to have multiple instances of, of multiple servers all serving this thing, you just throw them all in there. And there's a well-known, there's a, there's a well-defined algorithm for sorting out which server to connect to in a nice random fashion so you get pure load balancing. If you want to do that weighted, we'll stick, a, stick another number in the weight column and you'll get three times as much traffic to that server as, as all the other ones. If you want to do uh, high availability failover type situations, you do that too. We have the priority field. Everything with a lower priority will get contacted before anything with a higher priority goes as well. So this is fantastic, this is wonderful. But that's only one portion of service discovery. It's a really important one, but you also need to be able to find out all the instances of a service. And so for that you have service enumeration. For this, we use PTR records. They're not just for RDNS anymore. You can put anything on the, on the data side of a, of a PTR record and it just works. So in this case, we're saying that the, the app service has a foo instance and a bar instance. And if you need more of them, you just keep on listing them. Then you have metadata. Metadata is, is not often used, I must say, but when you need to use it, it's really, really, really important. Um, in the RFCs, they keep talking about uh, printers because it's Apple, you know, desktop -y stuff. They keep talking about printers and, you know, you have queue names in printers, so you need to put that in metadata. And it's just a TXT record. You'll notice all of these are completely standard, normal DNS record types that have been around for at least 17 years. So everything out there will probably support it. And you just throw in lumps of text. Um, you want to set your path for the Foo app, you know, so that everything talks to a subpath. Go for it, sit it in there, and if you need to set your Baz to Wombat, we'll go for your life. So hopefully by now you're like going, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. I can, I can see where this could work for me. And so the question is, why isn't everybody doing it? Um, in some ways, it's the same as, you know, if, you were, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? But there are some, there are some reasons that I've found over the years for, for why people aren't all, you know, standing up and, you know, chanting 6763, 6763. And the first one is it's just some desktop thing. This is a really, really common one. Um, in fact, I, I had a, an email from a colleague um, less than a week ago pointing out something in another RFC called multicast DNS. And that's where people get confused because these two RFCs came out at the same time, written by the same people and addressing sort of the same area. Now, the thing with multicast DNS is that it is quite, uh, it plays fast and loose in a couple of places, shall we say, with the basic DNS specifications. And it doesn't work very well in a server type environment. I know I've tried it, just leave it alone. So people think, oh, well, they're the same thing. So they must all be the same, no. DNSSD, as I said, uses completely standard record types, so you can put it onto any DNS server that's capable of supporting a 17-year-old standard. Probably some out there that are missing that, but yeah, <laughs> sorry for you guys. Um, now, there's another, there's another thing, not necessarily about this specification in particular, but about DNS in general. It's like a, it's like a cat cry. You've probably seen it in you know, Twitter threads or, or random emails. You know, oh, I'm, I'm hacking away at a problem. It can't possibly be DNS. Five seconds later. It was DNS. It's like a joke. It's, it's just this something that we've got in our heads. But it, no, but the thing is, DNS doesn't fall over all that often. When it does, it tends to be fairly spectacular. But for the most part, it's because it's so rare that DNS falls over, we remember it. It's a thing called regressive bias. We remember things that are very rare. So we worry about the fact that, you know, the, the tsunami is going to come and wipe us out when it's far more likely that there are other far more pedestrian things that are going to knock us out than a giant tsunami. So, and, and even if your DNS is having problems, it doesn't matter. You have to use DNS. You're on the internet. If you're on the internet, you're using DNS. If you have an unreliable DNS infrastructure, you need to fix it. The key to carrying around a lot of eggs is not to put them all in lots of baskets, it's to make a really good basket and then stick them all in one. And then you're sorted. So build yourself a really good, reliable DNS infrastructure and then stick all your service discovery records in there and your problem's solved. And the final thing that people complain about, I laugh at this one whenever I see it. I've seen so many blog posts saying, oh, you know, we were looking to deploy service discovery and we looked at serve records, but nobody supports serve records. 
So instead, we deployed this rando thing that has a RESTful web interface on it. Or even better, so I built this thing that has a RESTful web interface on it. What? Who supports your crazy ass RESTful web interface? Nothing. And the thing is, there are actually a fair number of things that do support serve records. And for the things that don't, add them. It's quite a simple, straightforward thing to do. It took me about three quarters of an hour to add it to a system the other week. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a hard protocol to understand. So if you don't, if you don't have it, add it. And you'll find there's things like HK Proxy, for instance, supports it. Prometheus supports it. A bunch of other things that you're probably using now do support it. They're just not shouting it from the rooftops quite as much as the latest you know, hipster container supporting jargon. So why should you use DNSSD? All those other reasons. Well, he's a, you know, sort of a summary type thing. For starters, yes, you are already using DNS. So why not just add some more DNS records? It's really not hard. But the thing that's really great, the thing that just get, blows me away about this, it is all completely standard. It is all interoperable. If you add DNS SD support to a service, that is the last service discovery mechanism you ever have to implement. Now, speaking as someone who is now up to his fourth, count them, four service discovery implementations, because the last three sucked, let me tell you, not having to rewrite for the, the RESTful web interface of the week is a fantastic idea. And the thing is that once I've done this, if, I, if it turns out that my DNS server doesn't scale or has some other crazy suck to it, I can swap it for another one. Um, at the moment, we're looking at using Power DNS with database backend, but I'm also looking at using a gossiping-based DNS server instead. So I can change these things out. I can try things out, and, ha and I ha don't have to worry about changing my client code. Everything will just keep interoperating, zip around back and forth. It's fantastic. And the really surprising thing is that DNSSD is actually a more complete solution than most service discovery mechanisms out there. It has, it has it all. It has all of your service-based stuff that you want. It has service enumeration, which some systems have quite a lot of trouble with. It also has weighted load balancing, which is quite rare, and priority-based um, failover. These are all fantastic features, and it's, it's hard to find a system that has all of them. So in short, in summary, DNSSD, it's awesome. You should use it. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your conference.